Welcome to Special Broadcast. I'm Ben Fall, here with former Governor of Maryland and former Democratic Governors Association Chairman Martin O'Malley. It's a pleasure to have you here, Governor. Thanks, Ben. Good being with you. Excellent. I'm going to start right in with it. In February, a Quinnipiac poll found that 84% of those polled had not heard enough about you to have either a favorable or unfavorable opinion. How do you let people know who Martin O'Malley is? Well, you, um, uh, you just go out and you do it. I mean, sometimes people ask, as I contemplate possibly running for president, <clears throat> how do you climb such a big mountain when you're relatively unknown? But history is full of instances where candidates uh, formulated a, a better framework for our country's future, had the ideas, the substance, and the executive experience, and were willing to go to those early states where people get to meet the candidates in Iowa and New Hampshire usually once or twice or three or four times before they have to make a decision. When I was in college, in fact, I was out in Iowa for a very little known candidate who only probably had one or two percent name recognition. Uh, but I saw as a young person working the Iowa caucuses just um, how seriously the people of Iowa and New Hampshire take their vote and, and listen to those candidates when they visit uh, the towns and when they speak. And so that's how a person becomes well known in this country and running for president. Uh, you're unknown for a long time and then suddenly you become very well known once those first contests happen. Uh, and history is also full of instances where the inevitable front runner is inevitable right up until he or she is no longer inevitable. And uh, so it's, a, it's an exciting process and very few people even get to consider it. And I consider myself blessed that I'm, that I'm even able to consider it. Like you just said, uh, talking about Iowa and New Hampshire, you, I know you've been recently visiting some of those states, including Iowa. Have you seen that making an impact on your image? Well, you know, it's, as I travel to these states, I mean, I, I don't gauge so much my image as, I'm, as, I, uh, as, I, as I listen for um, the hopes and, and aspirations and the, uh, and the desires of the people that I would, that I would offer myself to serve. Uh, in other words, uh, my purpose for going there and for talking to, whether it's the Democratic Party in Iowa or New Hampshire or last weekend in Kansas, is to help us together create a better story for where our country needs to go. I mean, you listen to the conversation on the other side of, uh, of the equation with the Republican Party, and it seems that many of the candidates seem to be doing backflips uh, over each other, trying to figure out who wants to cut our government the most, who wants to dismantle our government the quickest, and um, who can say the most disparaging things about new Americans and, and immigrants uh, who have come to our country to make our country better. Uh, there's, a, there's a better story we have to tell, and, and it's going to require leadership, it's going to require candidates, it's going to require our having a conversation about the, the, the stronger and, and more generous nation that we want to build and create for our kids. So that's my reason for going out there. I guess stated in a more succinct way, Ben, if you have uh, ideas to offer, and you have a better framework for our country's future, the name recognition and face recognition and those things will come. You just have to be about the business of, of the people that you're offering to serve. And then those other things take care of themselves. Great points, definitely. Uh, you just mentioned immigration, so I want to move on to that. And there's been some concern recently regarding wages and what could happen if the United States receives a large influx of immigrants. Um, and I know you have a very good background with uh, immigration reform and you took a lot of action while serving as governor. How should the U.S. address immigration reform and issues going forward? Well, I think that, I, I mean, I, the people, uh, you know, for those that say we should be fearful that the, these immigrants uh, might come here or might become part of the, our, our country and our open economy, I mean, these, uh, these people are already here and they are already part of our economy. They are not fully a part of our economy, though. Uh, while certainly there's some payment of taxes, the, the truth of the matter is that we become stronger as a country the more that people are included and the more fully people participate. 
And there are many studies that show that if we were to have immigration reform with a path to citizenship, that would not only be an immediate shot in the arm to uh, the longer term solvency of things like social security, but it would also help our federal budget situation because you would have more people contributing to, uh, to our country. So I'm very much in favor of immigration reform. I think it's one of the things that has made us the land of opportunity in the, in the hearts and minds and tongues of people all over this world. It's the fact that people from, from all over the globe can come here, work hard, and know that the harder they work, the better they will be able to provide for their children. I mean, that's what the American dream's about, and I think immigration and immigrants in every generation make us stronger. Of course, I say this on St. Patrick's Day, so I'm a little biased and, and feeling kind of hyped up on this one. I want to move on to uh, the economy, and recently you've spoken about limiting the influence of big money in politics and restoring the Glass-Steagall Act, which would require banks to keep their commercial investment activities separate. Uh, so what do you think would be accomplished by uh, doing these things? Yeah, well, I think, I think we have to look at uh, uh, the, our experience over the last 30 years and also um, how our economy was working before some of the rules were changed over these last 30 years. And I say this knowing that this was not solely something that uh, the Republican Party brought to our country. Some Democrats uh, were involved in some of these decisions as well. So, uh, but when we see that as a people we've made uh, decisions that have not served us well, then we need to make better and other decisions. Uh, we have been following for the last 30 years, for the most part, a trickle-down theory of economics that has a, a couple of major tenets, if you will. One is keep wages low. The second is concentrate wealth and capital in the hands of the few. And the third thing is that you should remove any and all regulations you possibly can so that that capital can be accumulated, I guess assuming that one day it will cause a cloudburst and all of those dollars will get reinvested back in the economy. We found that something burst, but it didn't result in job creation. It resulted in some horrible job losses. It very nearly kicked our country into the second Great Depression and caused people in Maryland uh, and every state in the Union uh, all sorts of economic hardship, people losing their homes, and we have not yet finished the job of preventing that from happening again. Glass-Steagall uh, was a, a reform that was uh, uh, pushed through some years ago that in essence allowed, uh, there was a time when the big banks couldn't gamble recklessly in the stock market and on, uh, on risky products and have the full faith and credit and the backing of all of us and our federal government as taxpayers. Glass-Steagall allowed the banks to engage in reckless speculative behavior. And uh, it created this phenomenon where the banks became too big to fail. Oh, they could fail, but if they failed, we all failed with them and we would go into a second Great Depression. So there are many people who acknowledge now that that change to allow the banks to gamble was something that was very bad for our middle class. Nearly, uh, uh, you know, as I say, nearly led us into a second Great Depression. And we haven't taken the actions to make sure that that cannot happen again. And I believe that we should. I believe we should reinstitute Glass-Steagall. I believe that, they should, that big banks should not be able, in essence, to gamble with other people's money or with us insuring them against losses from reckless gambling that would wreck our entire economy. So you say banks shouldn't gamble and you say the Glass-Steagall Act could help uh, prevent that, but what else could be done in regards to regulating Wall Street? Well, I think there's, there's a number of things. Uh, uh, there should be some sort of uh, uh, point system, if you will, I mean, if you, uh, if you uh, blow red lights or speed, there's certain points that are accumulated and eventually you lose your license. There's not really a system like that. There's not a three strikes and you're out for some of the reckless behavior uh, that has happened on, on Wall Street. Uh, I believe also that uh, some of the people uh, involved in our financial industry are even recognizing that if a bank's uh, 
Uh, it's not a matter of the bank being too big to fail. It's a matter of the bank being too big to succeed. And I think you're starting to see uh, uh, some questions. And, and uh, I think if a, bank, if a bank is too big to, uh, to fail without uh, hurting our economy, then it's too damn big and it should be broken up. And I believe that there also needs to be strong deterrence and that, um, and that we need to uh, apply rules and uh, be much more aggressive in enforcing those rules uh, through the regulatory and prosecutorial powers that we currently have to monitor uh, uh, the financial industry. So you've also called for a renewed commitment for collective bargaining. Uh, how do you think this will affect or help income inequality and bring wages back? Yeah, great question. Look, there's, um, there, were, there were a number of things that we did, and I don't even think we had a title for them because, because most of them had bipartisan support. We'll call it common sense economics from, say, 1947 for the next 30 years leading up to 1980s. Uh, we, uh, we recognized that... Uh, as Henry Ford recognized, that, um, that the more workers earn, the more money they have to spend in the economy and the better that is for economic growth. So for our own common good, uh, we, uh, uh, we made sure that periodically we raised the minimum wage from time to time so that it kept pace with inflation, so that family could actually live on what they earned. Uh, and we did that, uh, Democrats and Republicans together, uh, right up until the 80s. Uh, we also recognized that the rights of workers to organize and to collectively bargaining actually was a good thing because it meant that there was upward movement on wages, that wages rose uh, not only to keep pace with inflation, but also rose uh, as productivity rose. So the better our economy did, the more workers shared in that, the more money there was to buy the cars, the TV sets, and the other things. Uh, that demand, that consumer demand, that inclusion on the demand part of the equation in our economy. And so um, unfortunately, over the last 30 years, there have been a lot of efforts to roll back collective bargaining. And we're paying the price for it. This is the first time this side of World War II that we've gone for a whole decade, actually more than that now, 12 years with uh, wages actually declining for most of us instead of going up. And um, uh, uh, we also see that union membership has fallen to its lowest levels. And in over 20 states now, it's effectively impossible for unions to organize because of the laws that have been passed that, for, that uh, prevents them from being able to effectively collect dues to do their work. So that's why, uh, uh, that's why I believe that you know, unions, raising the minimum wage, raising the threshold for overtime pay, these are all things that we need to start doing again so that wages start going up. On a different note, as governor of Maryland, you did a lot to address climate change and global warming. What do you think needs to be done on a national level to address climate change? We need an American jobs agenda that's a match for the climate challenge. Uh, uh, retrofitting buildings, uh, for example, uh, and making them more energy uh, efficient would create 7,000 jobs for a year with about a billion dollars investment and give us the long-term benefit of bringing down our, our, uh, our carbon footprint. Uh, you contrast that to the $9 billion investment in, in Keystone and the Keystone pipeline, uh, which would add to our, our carbon footprint and would only support about 1,400 jobs or 2,000 jobs for a year. I believe that there is an economic case and a jobs case to be made for, for the climate challenge. We have to stop drawing straight lines to hell. And instead, we have to talk about meeting this climate challenge as an economic imperative, a national security imperative, and something that will make us more prosperous at the same time that it will allow us to create a more secure future for our grandchildren. Uh, in our state, uh, by having a policy, we, uh, uh, an e a renewable energy policy, increasing the portfolio standards so that we have more renewable energy on the grid, going after things like offshore wind, uh, 
uh, reducing energy uh, uh, usage. All of those things allowed us to create uh, uh, an emerging sector of clean tech and green tech jobs that we did not have before. I mean, we had virtually no jobs in solar uh, seven years ago. Now, as we add more and more solar uh, to uh, Maryland's grid, we've created over 2,000 jobs installing solar panels and the like. And I think you will see even more of that. Uh, so uh, that's what we need as a nation. We need a jobs agenda for America that's a match for the climate challenge. All right, well, let me be end with the big unknown. 2016, there's a lot of speculation. What can you tell us? Well, I'm very seriously considering a run for president in 2016. Um, I have had 15 years now as an executive uh, experience as a big city mayor, executive experience as uh, the governor of a state and guiding my state through a recession. And um, so I'm, I'm very seriously considering it. I believe that our country has big challenges and leadership's important to meeting those challenges. Uh, these, these problems did not come here by themselves. They did not blow in on the Gulf Stream. They were the product of human choices and leadership and yes, politics and a campaign and consensus and intelligent people casting their vote can create a better future for our country. And that's what I care most passionately about. So uh, I will uh, be making up my mind uh, with my family uh, by May. Well, I'm sure a lot of people will be looking forward to that announcement, myself included. Thank you, Ben. Thank you so much for joining us, Governor. Thank you, man. Good talking with you. Thank you. I'm Ben Fall, and this has been ATV Special Broadcast.